नमस्कार गुड मॉर्निंग वेलकम टू टूडेज वेबिनार ऑन सुनामी रिस्क रिडक्शन एंड रेजिलियंस jointly organized by national institute of disaster management ministry of home affairs and indian national ocean information services ministry of earth sciences tsunami are a series of waves usually generated by movement of the sea floor these movement are caused by different type of geophysical phenomena such as earthquakes landslide and volcanic eruptions Tsunamis are considered the most devastating natural hazard on coastal environment. Densely populated cities on coastal belts are the engines of economic growth and the center of innovation for global economy of respective nations. As we know, most of the global cities are located near the coast, facilitating trade and commerce. they are also located near the mouth of major perennial rivers which serve as conduit for commerce connecting rest of the world these location place major cities at a greater risk of natural hazard like cyclones flooding sea level rise tsunami etc with the increase intensity of economic exploitation in coastal belts these there is also an increase in socio economic consequences resulting from the hazardous action of tsunami waves generated from submarine seismic activity and other causes on 26 december 2004 the country's city of east indian ocean experienced and witnessed the most devastating tsunami in recorded history today's webinar on tsunami risk reduction and resilience aims to explore and debate the most recent advances towards tsunami risk reduction and resilience implementing prime minister 10 point agenda point number 5 where prime minister shri narendra modi ji urged to leverage on technology to enhance the efficiency of the disaster risk management efforts i hope that the various participants involved in this webinar will benefit immensely in improving the tsunami preparedness mitigation and emergency response not only in the coastal districts of the country but also provide the necessary support for consolidating the capacity building training education and research and development by professional in leading national institutions in the country to enlighten us more in this topic we have with us dr t shridhivasan kumar director in coes and major general manoj kumar bindal vsm executive director NIDM in the inaugural session and Dr J Radha Krishnan IS Principal Secretary Health and Family Welfare Department Government of Tamil Nadu Dr E Patabi Rama Rao Scientist Staff and Head TWG in Coes and Professor Surya Prakash Head GMR Division National Institute of Disaster Management in the technical session Unfortunately our chief guest Sri G Kishan Reddy Minister of State Ministry of Home Affairs could not join us in the webinar due to his busy schedule and he has some group of minister meetings now to raise the curtain of our inaugural session i would like to call upon ed and idm major general manoj kumar bindal vsm in these more than 3 decades of service to government of india he has held important command and staff assignment such as deputy director general in directorate of army air defense director of center for united nation peace keeping secretary of the international association of peace keeping training centers without further ado i request executive director national institute of disaster management major general manoj kumar bindal to deliver his keynote address over to you sir thank you dr arjit uh, thank you so much and uh, a very hearty welcome to all the participants who have joined and uh, a special uh, welcome and thank you to uh, dr uh, shrinivas kumar who is uh, uh, director in coes and uh, congratulations to him for taking over on 28th of august uh, and i also welcome uh, uh, dr j radhakrishnan ias principal secretary revenue and disaster management government of tamil nadu dr e patavi rama rao scientist staff and head odg uh, in coes and professor surya prakash head gmr division nidm who will Uh, giving the valuable and uh, enlightened talks uh, during this webinar this is a very important topic uh, and we are missing uh, i i forgot to mention we are missing our chief guest who had to go for a, a group of ministers meeting uh, 
so maybe next time we'll be able to get him on board. Uh, this, today we are discussing a very important uh, uh, topic of, of tsunami because this is one of those uh, low in, uh, low frequency but high intensity event. Uh, of India's uh, 7,516 kilometer coastline, 5,004 kilometers is along the mainland, 132 kilometers is in Lakshadweep, and about 1,900 out of that is in Andaman and Nicobar Island. Out of this, uh, nearly 70 percent, uh, that is 5,700 kilometers, are highly vulnerable to the impacts of tropical cyclones related and related hydrometeorological -meteor hazards and consequently to recurrent loss of life and properties. So these coastal states are also susceptible to the impacts of tsunami, drought, and floods. Studies indicate that natural disaster losses equate up to 2% of in India's gross domestic product and up to 12% of the central government revenue. So it's a quite a big figure. And it is now, uh, it has now well recognized that by taking long, medium and short-term mitigation measures, the loss of lives, economy, infrastructure, and environment can be minimized. And if the coastal communities are, if the coastal communities are uh, prepared to become resilient against such disasters, uh, they can recover from post-disaster situations and plan better for the reduced future risks. Hazard risk prevention and mitigation. It is a key to sustainable development. And this has been the policy of Government of India, which has lays, which lays great uh, emphasis on prevention, preparation, and mitigation. Uh, we are aware that uh, in Asia, the largest two such tsunamis happened within seven years of each other, challenging the knowledge on such disasters. The Indian Ocean tsunami, it was caused by a earthquake, a 9.1 magnitude earthquake on 26 December 2004, and it affected more than 15 countries, uh, which uh, uh, with lakhs of people uh, killed or like missing, number of houses destroyed, and uh, uh, millions getting displaced in uh, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, uh, then uh, uh, Again, in the 11th March 2011, the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami, it caused by 9.0 earthquake. In this, again, thousands of people were killed and were missing, and thousands of houses were destroyed, and millions of people had to be evacuated. So, in the context of, to India, the Indian Ocean tsunami of 26 December 2004 which devastated the coastal communities in Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Puducherry, Andaman and Nicobar Island, it prompted the government of India to take the pioneering step to establish appropriate institutional mechanisms for the effective management of disasters in India. So, As mandated, uh, the Disaster Management Act of 2005, which we call DM Act 2005, it was created and it created a multi-tiered institutional system with National Disaster Management Authority, NDMA, as the apex body for disaster management in India, chaired by the Prime Minister of India personally. Then at the state level, the State Disaster Management Authority, SDMA, chaired by respective chief ministers, and District Disaster Management Authorities, DDMAs, chaired by district collectors, and co-chaired by the chairpersons of the Jilla Parishads. So these bodies have been set up to facilitate the paradigm shift from the earlier relief-centric approach to a more proactive, holistic, and integrated approach of strengthening disaster preparedness, mitigation, and emergency response capacities in the country. So, but the absence of an effective tsunami early warning system and the last mile connectivity to disseminate alert and early warning messages to the coastal communities, as well as the lack of public awareness and emergency response preparedness uh, made the tsunami response very difficult and challenging in 2004. However, this is not the case now. Uh, in COIS, when uh, uh, in their uh, talk, they will be explaining to us how India has grown exponentially in this tsunami early warning system. And uh, it will be a great learning for that. 
In the DM Act 2005, the paradigm shift that we spoke about, it uh, it talks about a more pre proactive pre-disaster preparedness, mitigation, and improved capacities, response capacities approach. So it is also influenced, this particular paradigm shift is also influenced with the global risk practices, which have established that strengthening preparedness and mitigation strategies would considerably reduce the vulnerability of disaster prone communities and thereby reduce the risks associated with tsunamis in coastal areas. So guidelines have been prepared in recognition of the fact that even though it is a low probability event, it is capable of resulting in enormous loss of lives, loss of property, assets, and public infrastructure in the coastal areas. The main stakeholders uh, uh, in the tsunami risk management is the Ministry of Earth Sciences and the Department of Science and Technology with the scientific and technical institutions such as Indian Meteorological Department, Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services, inquiries with whom today we are collaborating to hold this uh, webinar, important webinar, then National Institute of, for Ocean Technology, NIOT, then Integrated Coastal Area and Marine Management Directorate, ICMAM, then Center for Earth Science Studies, uh, and many others are involved in this. But these were the main ones who are uh, leading the charge. I, here, I would like to say that it is very uh, important that the local Panchayati Raj institutions and local communities must be associated in the coastal resources, management of coastal resources, and for safeguarding human safety and ecological integrity in the coastal areas. That way we can uh, find more acceptability among the community for any intervention that is being planned. And also enhancing the economic well-being of the fishing and the farming communities along the shoreline through an integrated bioshield program uh, it, that needs to be given a higher priority. And in medium term, uh, medium term integrated and ecologically sociable, socially sustainable coastal zone management system, it should be put in place jointly by government agencies and coastal communities. Uh, it has to be a participatory approach. And public awareness, training, capacity building of professionals will go a long way in developing resilience to tsunami and preparing the community to face the next tsunami better. Uh, with this, I will finish my uh, initial keynote because I'm keen to hear uh, to Dr. Srinivas and all of the speakers will be coming after me. I once again thank uh, Dr. Srinivas for uh, uh, collaborating with NIDM on such an important topic and uh, educating the public because we have large number of uh, experts in academia who are part of the participants on such an important topic. Uh, thank you so much. Over to you, Dr. Harjit. Thank you very much, sir, for our keynote address. Sir spoke about vulnerability of coastal state to natural hazard. And after 2004 tsunami, Indian government set up an institutional mechanism for tsunami risk reduction and data adaptation. Thank you very much, sir. Now, I would like to call upon Dr. T. Sashan Kumar, Director Inquiries. He joined Inquiries in 2004 as a scientist C. Prior joining to Inquiries, he has also served in RRSC, Indian Space Research Organization. He penned several research articles in some of the most reputed national and international journals. He is decorated with several prestigious awards to a name of few National Geosciences Award, Kalpana Chavla Memorial Award, Disaster Mitigation Award, and many more. With these words, I would request Dr. T. Srinivasan Kumar for his opening remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much uh, to Ms. Harjit Kao. Um, uh, a very good morning, uh, Major General Manoj Kumar Bindal, Executive Director of uh, NIDM, um, uh, distinguished speakers, uh, Patabi Ramarao, uh, my colleague uh, who is head of the Tsunami Warning Group, uh, Dr. J. Radhakrishnan, IAS Principal Secretary, Revenue and Disaster Management, Government of Tamil Nadu, uh, Professor Surya Prakash, uh, NIDM, uh, officials of NIDM and uh, several participants of this webinar. Um, a very good morning to all of you. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank Major General Manoj Kumar Bindal, uh, Executive Director of uh, NIDM, uh, 
uh, and colleagues at uh, NIDM for organizing this uh, very important webinar on tsunami risk reduction and uh, resilience uh, and for inviting me to uh, provide opening remarks. This event by NIDM and uh, jointly by it highlights the importance that the government accords to uh, disaster risk reduction activities in the country, specifically with respect to tsunamis. Uh, as uh, uh, Major uh, uh, Manoj Kumar Bindal already mentioned in his remarks, leveraging technology to enhance the efficiency of disaster risk management efforts is one of the very important aspects of the uh, 10 point agenda announced by the Honorable Prime Minister during the Asian Ministerial Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction in 2016. And I'm very happy to note that today's webinar uh, addresses this important aspect uh, with the distinguished speakers covering both upstream and downstream components of the end-to-end -end, uh, tsunami warning and mitigation system. The Great Indonesian Earthquake, uh, which is of magnitude 9.2 of December 26, 2004, and the devastating tsunami, which is uh, more commonly called as the Boxing Day tsunami, uh, it actually caused uh, an unprecedented loss of lives. About 230,000 people lives were lost billions of dollars in damage uh, was caused uh, to properties across the entire Indian Ocean region. Uh, and uh, in India alone, 60, 000, uh, 16 thousand lives were lost. And this event got etched in history as the deadliest uh, the world has ever uh, witnessed in recorded history. So those tsunami hazards in the Indian Ocean region uh, are very low frequency as compared to other hazards like cyclones. Like for example, every year we have one or two cyclones. They are more frequent, but not uh, unlike tsunamis where they are not very frequent. Uh, but still, uh, when they uh, when they happen, they can be very devastating. Um, and we are vulnerable. The Indian Ocean coastal regions, including India, are vulnerable to tsunamis. And recognizing this, the government of India made two very important and landmark decisions that provided the technical and policy framework under which the today's tsunami early warning uh, you know, system operates. On the technical front, the Ministry of Earth Sciences was directed to coordinate the establishment of a tsunami warning system uh, in coordination with all the other scientific departments like the Department of Science and Technology, Department of Space, et cetera. And uh, on the policy front, the Disaster Management Act 2005 was enacted, followed by uh, uh, the preparation of guidelines for the management of tsunamis by the National Disaster Management Authority in 2010, along with our, all the other uh, stakeholders. Um, so coming to the warning system itself, the Ministry of Earth Sciences established a state-of-the-art war center at the Hyderabad-based Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services, where I'm located. Um, and this was done in a record time of two years in, in collaboration with National Institute of Ocean Technology, ICMAM, Survey of, Survey of India, National Remote Sensing Agency. And this system has been operational since 2007. So this provides the technical core of the warning system. Uh, the center is capable of detecting tsunamis happening anywhere around the globe, and especially within Indian Ocean. We can detect those tsunamis within less than 10 minutes after any major earthquake in the Indian Ocean. And it has been fl functioning flawlessly since its inauguration in 2007. Uh, in addition to our responsibility for India, the center also provi provides tsunami warnings to all the other uh, coastal uh, countries in the Indian Ocean region. There are about 25 countries. We act as one of the tsunami provi service providers for all these countries, along with Australia and Indonesia. So this is actually, this framework is established by the Intergovernmental Coordination Group for the Indian Ocean Tsunami Warning and Mitigation System. So this operates under the Intergovernmental uh, uh, Oceanographic Commission of the UNESCO. And uh, we, uh, India, um, contribute significantly to the initiatives in the region. Uh, so INCOIS has established cutting edge technology to detect tsunamis. So we have uh, seismometers, we have undersea tsunami buoys, 
we have coastal tide gauges, we have uh, state-of-the-art computing systems, modeling systems. So my colleague Patabi will talk about all these things later in his talk, but uh, I want to just reiterate that we have a very high-end state-of-the-art warning center, which is actually one among the best uh, in the world. And, uh, but the thing is, all this high-end technology and the best warning system will not be uh, effective if public do not understand the warning and they do not rep respond appropriately. So the downstream community awareness and preparedness plays a crucial role in tsunami risk reduction and resilience. And the national, state, and district disaster management authorities, they come into play uh, at this uh, point, actually, to enhance the capacities of disaster management officials and communities, uh, as well as training institutions such as NIDM. They play a very important role in this aspect, in the downstream aspects. Uh, as a technical agency, INCOIS also facilitates this process by facilitating workshops such as this one jointly with an IDM. We organize training sessions for state and district level disaster management officials and uh, other agencies. We also organize uh, uh, tsunami drills, ocean-wide tsunami drills, once every two years, and then national tsunami drills once every year in coordination with all the states with the uh, with the NDMA and IDM the uh, and all disaster management agencies and these drills are very important to strengthen the readiness to handle such tsunami emergency situations so the last drill was in uh, 2018 uh, there was a national mega mock exercise which was done with uh, MHA and NDMA in November 2017 and then the next uh, drill upcoming drill is going to be very shortly uh, in uh, October 2020. Uh, 20. Uh, so we will, INCOIS will communicate and the MHA will communicate and DMA will communicate with all of you regarding details of this drill and it will be very useful to participate. Um, and then uh, one last thing that I would like to mention here on the, on the downstream preparedness and enhancing resilience is a very new initiative which is called the concept of uh, tsunami ready. So this is an innovative concept that has been recently launched by the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of the UNESCO. And then we have developed uh, guidelines for tsunami ready. And this tsunami ready provides a structured approach to building tsunami preparedness in the, in the communities, in the coastal communities. And this is done as a collaborative project between public, community leaders, national and local emergency management agencies. Now, why this is very unique, all the time, when you talk about warning system, we generally think about technology, sensors, and all that upstream part. Uh, so this tsunami ready uh, puts communities uh, in the center of the whole warning system, because that is most important, actually. So putting communities in the middle, you know, you, you, you can then check uh, against several indicators uh, if the communities are really prepared, whether the communities can receive warning if there is a threat, whether the community has a community response plan, whether the community has sirens. So all these things, there are level indicators with the communities need to meet to be pronounced as tsunami ready. So recently, uh, the, the, the Odisha State Disaster Management Authority has come forward and then piloted this program. It was actually a big effort start, that started in 2018, and very recently, IOC has uh, uh, recognized two communities in uh, Venkatraipur uh, on, in uh, uh, Odisha, and then Nolia Sahi in Odisha as being uh, tsunami ready. So they have this UNESCO recognition now, and then there are several communities that are coming forward to implement this program, and tsunami uh, in Kois is happy to always guide with. Uh, uh, implementing such community preparedness programs. And why these are again important is these community uh, tsunami ready uh, uh, programs, they not only help with tsunami preparedness, but they also help with other coastal hazard preparedness. Like if a community is ready for tsunamis, they are more or less ready for, uh, you know, to act against cyclones. So we are building their capacity. So this is a very important program that we will continue to pursue along with all the other disaster management agencies. And on the technical front, we are actually making a lot of improvements into the future. We are uh, installing sensors called GNSS sensors, 
to enhance the timeliness and accuracies of warnings. We are actually working on near field atypical tsunamis because uh, you know tsunamis can also be caused by uh, landslides, submarine landslides, and then tsunamis, we give a warning in 10 minutes. But recently, uh, in, in 2018, a tsunami happened in Indonesia, which is called the Palu tsunami, where tsunami waves came ashore in three minutes, which means people should be also prepared to identify the natural signs of a tsunami and respond appropriately if there are regions which have such a hazard. So, INCOIS is also working on technical aspects of near field atypical events. So, with these few words, I would like to uh, thank all of you for participating in this sem seminar. I would like to thank NIDM, especially uh, Major Gen General Manoj Kumar Bindal for having me and inviting me uh, to this uh, 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 to this webinar. And uh, I, I wish you uh, a, a successful webinar and uh, I'm sure there are interesting talks coming up. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for highlighting our participants about role of Ministry of Earth Sciences in early warning system prospects and NDMA that include uh, tsunami risk management guidelines to outline interagency roles and responsibilities, tsunami risk preparedness, mitigation and response. An effective tsunami early warning system is achieved when all persons in vulnerable coastal communities are prepared and respond appropriately and in a timely manner upon recognition that a potentially destructive tsunami is approaching. Timely tsunami warning issued by a recognized tsunami warning center are essential. With that, we have come to end of our inaugural session and now we will move ahead with our technical session. During the technical session, there will be presentation and once all the presentations are over, we will have question answer session at the end of the technical sessions. Your active participation is very important to us kindly Q&A window only to raise question. One more important announcement that participants having 60% and above attendance in Cisco Webex platform will be eligible for certificates. No certificates of participations for attending training program via YouTube platform. For our first presentation, we have with us Dr. J. Radha Krishnan. IAS Principal Secretary, Health and Family Welfare Department, Government of Tamil Nadu. J. Radha Krishnan is an Indian civil servant and administrator who is primarily known for his relief work in Nagapatnam and Tanjavur district during the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami, which gained worldwide appreciation. His administrative skills were lauded by former American President Bill Clinton when he visited Nagapatnam district as the United Nations Secretary General Specials Envoy for Tsunami Recovery on May 2007, uh, sorry, May 27, 2005. During his long tenure as a Health Secretary, uh, Tamil Nadu Health Department reached few important milestones in maternal morality rate, organ donations, he did commendable task in preventing outbreak of epidemics after Chennai flood and controlling the rise of dengue cases. Since February 2019, he has taken over as a principal secretary transport department in government of Tamil Nadu. Uh, now I would like to call upon Dr. J. Radha Krishnan for his presentation. Over to you, sir. Okay. Uh, good, good morning, everybody. And first of all, I uh, respected uh, Major General Bindalji, uh, uh, respected Director Inquiry Srinivas, uh, Haji, Dr. Harjit, and my dear friend Dr. Suri Prakash and Patabi Ram and all the participants. I will try my best to share my content. If it comes through, that is okay. Otherwise, I will uh, read through my presentation. Now, uh, okay. So, yeah. I, okay. Uh, so, you see, basically, you know, I think we had an excellent inaugural session where they have touched upon all the important things. I have basically come because uh, unfortunate tsunami I had handled uh, during that time. I was a neighboring district collector. I, I am not going through the mail. Uh, I'm just showing you because quite a lot of our participants would not have been younger. What happened is just as like, a scene of uh, this, many people would have seen, but uh, the idea is showing this uh, video is not to, to show that this video exists, but if you look at the people who are standing there, uh, as a tsunami is coming, nobody is aware. 
that time. That uh, what was a tsunami? They were just looking at it. Water had gone back, and this is that famous Kanyakumari thing. Nobody is uh, even going running to the high ground. That's the site I just wanted you all to appreciate. And in Tamil, he has been saying that, you know, I am being dragged inside. That's the voice which you are hearing. And uh, actually, this uh, final wave will be much more higher than even the Vivekananda rock. Next slide. As you go to the next slide, why tsunami actually, I, though our inquiries director, everybody has contacted, I, I actually want to pick up on that. That day I was Tanjavur collector, which is uh, next to district to Nagapatnam. That day it was unknown to India. I even felt a shake at 6 like a.m., but nobody reacted to it. It was stealthy and ferocious. And by 9 when it hit, nobody was aware. And being a Sunday, it resulted in huge loss of life, property and livelihood. Touch wood today because of government of India's effort, setting up of inquiries, all these things. In 10 minutes, you are able to do. And I'm very confident that, you know, if we respect what happened that day and recollect regularly, in these 10 minutes, we would have saved the lives which happened. Next, next, next. This is again the next site. This is Nagapattam town. And generally, when a tsunami hits, people get hurt. And this is a site of a general hospital. And you can see the nurses lying on top. And this is a way of coming down to an unprofessional camera. Somebody has uh, taken that. And uh, up to first floor, the water is receding. Next slide. And this is the site after the water has receded. This is Velangani. Why I am bringing all this to the notice of all the distinguished uh, participants is many of them, many of us, you know, generally after a disaster, that tends to fade. Uh, an event which happens once in a, uh, it's not as frequent a cyclone, we tend to forget it. Next slide. Again, if you look at the challenges, you know, I was immediately asked to rush from Tanjavur to Nagapatnam because it had, through a microwave phone, the sub-collector called me. This is the first site when I went to the GH in an unaffected place, 900 bodies. And uh, the roads uh, broken, all the buildings gone. Next. And, uh, you know, approach roads are totally in the coastal area next what why we use it as a case study particularly the nagapatnam for uh, when you come up to resilience next nagapatnam is a very peculiar place it juts out like a nose uh, just above sri lanka so most cyclones when it hits south very rarely you have hitting it in kanyakumari or uh, rameshwaram which are all protected by sri lanka but nagapatnam and kadalur are the uh, flash points as far well as concerned History, can, you can see the number of you know, big cyclones and the deaths which you have seen. I have not included uh, uh, the Gaja cyclones uh, uh, total deaths. It has not been updated. Next. And again, whenever this disaster strike, it is a place which is known for flood. October 2004 was there. When I talk of resilience, next. Again, in 2005, flood is there. It is frequently flooding uh, these challenges. So when we have to look into these challenges which a district like Nagapatnam, which generally we is told as a, a Florida as far as India is concerned, because you know most of the cyclone hit. What happened in Nagapatnam? The challenge was 6,065 people died. Totally in, uh, I think India roughly 13,000 people, died. almost 8,018 died in Tamil Nadu, India, uh, in Tamil Nadu, out of which 76% of death was in Nagapatnam. Next. Again, this was the unprecedented disaster scale. Next. These are the challenges when I landed up in the district from a neighboring district. This is a site you can see next. Again, this is a very, you know, uh, not a human right oriented slide, but for the participant to realize what happens next. This is the way that could be the car which you say people are bringing bodies from the coastal areas dumped as if it is a, uh, you know, awful distribution thing. Next. This is the site of relief camps. There are thousands of them. The way people are why this we are showing is to end I, I, the last few slides will be on the resilience. 
what happened background is all the 73 habitations in the coast 187 kilometer coast got affected access was damaged many reported dead majority being women and children power cut off water supply affected several villages flattened large scale panic people are not aware area staff overwhelmed this is a very important point that you know revenue inspectors wiped conservancy staff sanitary inspector how people's houses destroyed and the entire staff was exhausted after dealing with floods in october and november 2004 they were just recovering the then we inundated so many people got had to be evacuated and the biggest point if you look at 4592 of the 6068 people died in a 10 km stretch between nagapatnam and velangani our image, that is why we always say that you know when we say that you know bandaiche is a ground zero as far as tsunami was concerned nagapatnam is turned as ground zero because the per square kilometer death was in the range of 450 in some concentrated areas immediate concern dispersal of dead body respire all these are standard thing prevention of next what initially these are lesson to local administration we then realized that you know they are overwhelmed we called in navy red cross relief centers are opened but uh, around the clock dispersal of body was organized next honorable cm visited on the same day next rain abates in the morning i why i am recollecting is these are issues many people tend to forget helicopter reconnaissance was done to find where bodies were there food was air dropped in unreachable areas sanitary workers were brought in neighboring districts were brought in bodies strewn around were brought in one place but the army was called in last three points if you see despite best intentions and efforts there was large scale public outcry reported in several unreached areas and press portrayed initial chaos next third day we real disaster i was there from day one assist in the neighboring uh, district then i went and you no know, secretaries were brought in incident command post was set up at collector's office and the incident command system which actually had just uh, started in and i dm and all had started those trainings uh, people had gone for the training in lbsna along with an we put in that place next incident commander doubles up an operational chief 73 what we decided was divided the 73 habitation into seven contiguous habitation each and brought in a collector level person for, to head along with a minister with self contained deep self contained teams and we gave financial flexibility next the point which i am asking others to notice for all disasters we tend to bring in people but very rarely tsunami was one instance where they gave the project leaders financial flexibility from tr funds and money was drawn given to them and they were provided officials who could need not go back to collector for sanction so that helped in having seven villages having a collectorate level supervision along with a minister next this i'm just showing the level of mobilization of ias officers and the teams next this why i'm showing is people should say that these were these were people were made in charge uh, uh, so that the collector is supported area monitoring teams next i again we mobilized large scale machinery mobilized just like it happens in other things the website was started next the removal these all things started uh, going on a little bit more effectively next Yeah, yeah next these are all i think everybody knows i don't want to repeat you know we started cooking food started within 10 days some of the schools so that normal life starts next we provided flexibility in restoring light by providing flexibility in rates to be given to the laborers next and you know instead of that old very first few days complicated thing we put both a manual and also a website a digital photography uploaded I, we started making it in a much more organized fashion distribution was done next and police everybody was doing all round work next next again you know we had a lot of visitors the present deputy cm that time was pwd minister various ss officers team started doing restoration the governor visiting next again you know, using debris another example with the army which we tried in the backwaters next medical response was very critical and it was divided into three stage immediate and also on trauma care and mental health next next this mobilization everybody has unicef and undp was invited they actually it was we decided that instead of being very possessive about it 
anybody coming with capacity. They were invited. They did a, a rapid needs assessment and they came. They said, we, we ourselves will start building up the temporary toilets. Next. No epidemic was basically because we utilize the capacity. Next. These are the kind of works. Next. Next. Again, media management is very important. With the, that time itself, 24 by 7, and today it is multiple by 7. So we, we strengthened it. Most importantly in this slide is regular field coverage of governmental rescue and also non-governmental activities were arranged. And most importantly, we ensured transparency. Media center was set up. And it was not only a one-sided positive coverage. If they brought in something negative also, it was attended to immediately. Next. End of massive, you know, immediate relief is always uh, there. Unlike the present pandemic, you know, most of the disasters give you an opportunity that once the disaster is there, uh, we started focusing on other issues like confidence building, transport, opening up schools. Next, special focus. This is one area which gets neglected. In tsunami, we found the challenges of orphans, semi-orphans, destitute women, you know, husbands, no more, widows. Old age people, physically, mentally handicapped person, revival, and most importantly, women who are 14 to 18 years, children at least could not realize the loss, but 14 to 18 year old destitute uh, uh, women, these are all issues which you should not neglect. Next care of orphans, these all were built in our relief program. And in fact, Government of India and World Bank and many agencies joined together, and most importantly, NGOs. Next. Orphans is the challenges which we failed, almost 1,250 on orphans. Next. We created a new orphanage, till now it runs, of course, not with tsunami children, but with the uh, other regular orphans, old age pensions were done, doubling up of nutrition was done. Next. These are all some of the challenges, both on the social side. Next. You know, camps were differently abled. Next. What happened was immediately by 31 12, we could restore basic connectivity, and by another one month, we could do uh, third, uh, another one month basic relief could be a long way to go. Next, temporary shelter. Then we realized that you know we cannot keep people in relief camps, so we had to build in temporary shelters in the areas uh, that was the main issues, and decided on building permanent shelters also. Next. Psychosocial support was extended. Many activities were done that we can share separately also with the team. Next. Now, this is where the resilience aspect comes. What happened was when we decided to build back the government of India and various international and the national agencies was build back better. Large scale NGO government coordination was that this is one area where NGO was given empowered to work with government where they were allowed to sign agreements with the district administration with the consent of thing and they were able to bring plus World Bank and other schemes were basically to look at a very planned kind of redevelopment fisheries to bring back fisheries in organized way agriculture removing the sand and then bringing it so everything had a resilient approach inside it and also for uh, uh, you know uh, uh, the agriculture laborers schools and uh, the present concept of you know multi hazard shelters got its uh, seeding during tsunami post tsunami constructions next again if you look at adb's focus was w uh, world bank's focus was more on immediate uh, construction in a building but ADBs was on strengthening the livelihood measures. So they, again, uh, that focus also helped. Next. Again, IFAD is again a very long project where you know, micro and rural finance were there, community resource management, which uh, our inquiry director was also mentioning, and the director and ad was mentioning. Large scale involvement of community was done. Next. Again, these were some of the visible development. I'll go to the next. Uh, 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 the last slide is most important thing. Second last slide. Uh, roads relayed were basically looking, if you look at all the items are important. The using self-help group, multi-hazard resident general hospital, the next tsunami or a flood comes means the hospital will not get inundated. All the houses had uh, uh, multi-hazard features including insurance and also escape routes. Roads relayed, bridges uh, were constructed with a plan to have an escape route because we found earlier Nagapatnam many villages had only one Similarly, in worst affected Akarapete, a seawall was constructed and many places, shelter-built plantations, eco-friendly plantations have been raised. 
and vulnerability reduction in coastal community as a program was implemented with World Bank assistance, looking at next level of protection. Next. These were some of the planned, you know, unplanned houses getting destroyed was the site which you saw. This uh, land use planning and zoning without compromising on the need of fishermen. Next of the houses in very, very congested labor colony, multi uh, level, you know, one floor, double floor houses are also built. Next. These are disaster resilient houses which are built. Next. Again, if you look at this lower level bridge was, uh, which was uh, blocking that has been removed and a very big port has come, uh, fishing port, fishing port and a high level bridge has been constructed and uh, shelter level plantations are also put up. They are all now big plantations. Next. And again, in the information kiosk, new fish landing centers, schools became multi hazard shelters. Next, again, these are uh, up to two. What we realized was a two floor high sand dune had protected, and there was hardly one death or two deaths. Whereas, there were when there was no shelter belt, the deaths was very high. So, that has been uh, you know protected sand dunes. Well, in other areas, shelter belt plantations are raised. Next, again, same worst area where you know it's a heavy also built in seawall, particularly in Akarapete and Kichangupam, where 2,500 people died, and they are very close to the sea. Next. And again, instead of like very small boats, steel boats okay, and okay, okay, resistance, you know, resilient boats were also introduced, okay, along with insurance. Again, self-help group, they started having backward linkages on the necessity, like block for reconstruction to build in resilience. Next. Next. School-based disaster risk education was introduced. Next. Again, these are some of the visitors, but the last few slides are more important. Next. Nick, Madam again came. Uh, next. You know, all over India, we had the Bill Clinton visiting, appreciating a lot of work done by the people, the resilience shown by them. Next. Uh, he's basically appreciating the uh, uh, people there. Next. Uh, late president, he spent almost a day and worked on a very important thing, which I learned. A press asked him that, you know, why you are not able to build 50,000 houses within six months? He said, gentlemen, please understand. Now let, let the collector not answer. I will answer. It is not a reconstruction or a building construction program, but a habitat redevelopment program. That is the kind of clarity which he brought. Next. For such what lessons we learned for such disasters of unimaginable model, we should immediately induct capable official manpower material, role of armed services, I still always believe. Now, we have very good NDR of contingent, but we should immediately, when the when we get overwhelmed, also bring in NDR of Army, Navy. Then role of corporate in peace times, you know, bring in. We had Kudambalam giving cranes, we had ONGC giving crane, but many a time they don't get documented in the plan. We have to update these at all levels on a regular way. Reassess resource managing hostile public we need to uh, tell our administration that understand that they are in such long grief somebody has lost his dear one somebody has lost his property ngos have been a very big strength i firmly believe that you know working in a complementary fashion with ngo is the best way forward because they have empathy and capacity I, 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 but they may not have funds so that is where i think we should do similarly media once we start partnering them support us, victims to be encouraged and cooperated in relief captivity, benefited greatly from services of voluntary organizations. Next. Continuously, we have to update disaster preparedness at all level, uh, benefited from independent documents. Many times when we document our work, it is only positives. I tell that, you know, temporary shelters are of not much, we have to improve a lot. Again, we have to constantly reassess the needs. So these are all lessons which we should openly learn. And if an independent person comes, it helps. Next, NITM does a, did a very good study, both on Kumbhakonam fire tragedy and uh, even in tsunami, they all visited us. In fact, the NITM director came, cook food supply. Currently, when I come back, you know, institution created under DM Act, like DM, I, I, I should come up with implementable plans as per the national policy and guidelines. Ready reckoner is needed. And many a times, you know, we have a very good book. But at the grassroots level, they need simple, understandable instructions, what they need to do. Most importantly, community-based disaster preparedness is the key and robust early warning system on the other side and development of standard operating procedures are all linked to each other. 
these if we you know keeping on guiding people and telling our ddms uh, revising them and you know refreshing their memory it will go a long way next are we prepared for unknown disasters even that time i was telling that you know we we are, we are very nagapatnam is very very resilient as far as flood and cyclone is concerned but when suddenly tsunami came they were caught on numbers no we are prepared i am sure that with inquiries in a minute we get the uh, alert and the systems are in place but what about a newer disaster in disasters together and uh, uh, today's pandemic is another lesson next what we again find a challenge at the cutting edge level for administration is despite our best efforts people continue to live with risk they say that you know i we would like to uh, we continue for there instead of you know talking only about drr we need to also ensure that early warning system is there to evacuate them in time sharing information knowledge sharing should the biggest tribute we can give for people who have lost their lives is to refresh what happened so that in case of a fresh disaster in case of, like you know orissa super cyclone was a, a very important event gujarat earthquake was an important event similarly this uh, tsunami similarly you know many ngos and undp project unicef projects again nidms uh, uh, material uh, you know knowledge base should be shared and people who attend them should be training of trainers who go back and sharing of course highlighting the need of safe buildings why i am saying is 20 meter from the sea a building which was resilient survived whereas almost 1 km inside uh, in the coast without any safety a building without any protection was uh, had been totally destroyed which you saw haiti and chile earthquake comparison we say chile earthquake was 10 times higher this happened uh, somewhere in 2009 10 but haiti was far lesser but 2 lakh people right chile hardly 700 so this is a lesson which we need to constantly tell people a preparedness can save life and i am really thankful to inquiries that you know today if such a tsunami comes i am very sure that you know considering the media alert and the uh, inquiries alert we will be able to evacuate people next even country like japan found it difficult when march 11 earthquake came because along with tsunami fire accident happened and you know uh, uh, earthquake earthquake tsunami fire accident with uh, uh, fukushima nuclear disaster similarly need to build uh, implement building bylaws somewhere down the line you know we this is not an earthquake related earthquake has a link to tsunami but in india north india and several other places earthquake building bylaws are something which uh, people look at shimla look at many places where we are sitting on a very risky thing need to ensure invest in risk reduction measures somewhere risk reduction you know climate change is equally important but gets lot more importance whereas risk reduction is taken as a more a byline in cabinet not saying that risk reduction measures have been included in the project what exactly is included is not clear many highways uh, uh, roads have become like you know uh, create artificial flooding need to have robust early warning system and you know many a times in the village level warning system the batteries are not replaced so we need to constant that is where this uh, ocean drill is very useful need for greater awareness and coordination parts between design it is it is not any more an affected people government or an interest under issue it is everybody's problem next ground reality even now despite so much of you know brainstorming and guidance by ndma nidm and the individual warning agencies systematic effort include drr is still missing look at karachi flood last week the same thing happened 2015 in chennai like same similarly things happen in uh, generally the memory seems to be uh, rescue and relief is uh, uh, the focus areas they should be uh, focus areas but unless we make ddma sdma vibrant and not linked to disaster period i am very happy that you know now sdma meetings get get regularly for pandemic uh, our honorable chief minister conducted 14 sdma meetings this was not the case even in 2007 8 that time people had not recognized the ndma used to have meeting have meetings these are lessons need for effective coordination visible common sense result oriented administration and men material money show cutting edge needs men 
cutting edge needs material in case something is affected other district should immediately pump in the vehicles gaza cyclone we found we needed 100 jcbs need for effective interstate interdistrict coordination this is not related to tsunami need to make sdms dms operational in the real sense of term not in the real sense of meetings need have a complementary gap filling approach among departments and not competitive this is one thing where you know people are dying and people are maimed are in a, so here we need to take everybody's knowledge base including uh, other knowledge people who are working in plants who are uh, intellectuals who are in academics next way forward develop implement have specific roles and build capacities through focus tracks use skills and responsibility developed by integrating them have such capacities even among government like, you know, UN agencies have such capacities. Suppose you have a capable person, enlist him, and he is willing to go uh, to volunteer, he should be allowed and provide he can take decision, provide necessary equipment, have redundant communications, which may be tested, develop last mile connectivity to communicate early warning, and create awareness to ensure that individual institutions also have plan. Next. Again, these are next. These are all there. I just, uh, next, next. I would like to finish because uh, next, next, next. I, I, what I mentioned previous slide, previous slide. Mandatory, whether it is fire, whether it is tsunami, we should, uh, I went to US. I found that there is a drill for leher when an entire mountainside falls, doesn't happen. That person says that if it really happens, we will also be uh, dead, but they do the drill. Unfortunately, many a times, of course, no NIDM, NDMA uh, make it, are making it mandatory. Others should be made to realize that that is important. Many a time in fire drill, if it is not done, we find the escape route lock. For this, clear guidelines must be given for continuous updating monitoring. Next. These are some of the you know, evacuation zone, evacuation center, mock deals by NDRF, prepared memory. Every year, we need to you know check up whether it is being done and also in next. Last slide, I think it will be awareness campaign, training officials, mass and training, DM plan, DM teams, small drills. Everything is equally important and cannot be ignored. Last slide. Snapshot of various activities. Next. This I am ending. This is one year in the place where you saw the dead bodies. I always say that we have a responsibility to the same fishermen and fisherwomen who lost almost 2,500 lives in Akrapete. One year later, you see the resilience. The duty of administrators, professionals, NGOs, uh, UN agencies, uh, Government of India is we should respect them. We should respect the dead. And we should say that, you know, they, despite so much of loss of life, they come back and they do. So if we all join together and we have that humility to understand that every disaster is a tough disaster, we should all work together. It will be a very safe future we can develop. Last slide. This again is a girl. We found as a three month old baby whom I uh, am holding. This, her name is Meena. Now she is doing her degree. She doesn't know her parent. She doesn't know where she came from. Like that, there are still three people. Rest of the people, extended family has taken. Other government uh, thing. So these are the people who are the victims of uh, disaster. This is a poignant slide, which always make me realize that, you know, there is so much we have done. We should be proud for what government of India has done, what NDMA has done, what NIDM has done, what MHA has done, what inquiries like agencies and early warning agencies, Indian Meteorological Department has really done great work, all these agencies. But still, NGOs are doing government, but there is so much more to do. With that slide, I would like to end and thank NIDM and the director and uh, in question, all the participants for giving an uh, opportunity to share this uh, experience. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for showing video of real scenario during 2004 tsunami. Nagapatnam in Tamil Nadu was high risk vulnerability in tsunami 2004. Real on ground scenario of relief work in Nagapatnam and Thanjavur district during 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake tsunami is highlighted by sir. He underlined that vulnerable groups such as orphans, children, women, old age group, etc. need special attention in any disaster. And there is a need to build effectively on our experience and mechanism for mobilizing vulnerable groups towards greater preparation in facing disasters and emergency situations. Thank you very much. 
and we are very fortunate to learn from your experience and expertise sir thank you very much and uh, moving ahead we have with us patabi rama rao scientist f head of twg in coes sir joined in coes in 2000 <coughs> as a scientist he is a body of numerous awards namely indian national geo special award national award for e governance uh, for inquest website and open portal under the category best website he sent more than 20 papers in national and international journals now i would like to call upon dr patabi for his presentation the floor is yours sir uh, thank you mr harjit once again and uh, at the outset uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Executive Director Ma Major General Manoj Kumar Bindal and uh, uh, Professor Suri Prakash uh, for giving us this opportunity to organize this very important uh, webinar on uh, tsunami risk reduction and resilience. Uh, you have seen the presentation. Uh, thanks to uh, Dr. J. Radhakrishnan, Principal Secretary uh, from Tamil Nadu. He has shown the impact of uh, tsunami, and then he has shown he has also shown these uh, the post uh, disaster uh, recovery activities and all, and it shows the intensity of the, the tsunami and the impact that it can pose uh, to the coastal communities. So he has rightly touched upon uh, two important points, uh, like you know, having robust early warning system and then community based preparedness and last mile connectivity. so i am going to talk uh, basically on the indian tsunami early warning uh, system which i am going to touch upon these points as well as uh, the point uh, uh, one point the leveraging uh, technologies for efficient management of disasters which is one of the 10 point agenda of the prime minister and also i am going to touch upon some of the uh, activities that incois initiated on tsunami risk reduction and uh, resilience so uh, i am going to briefly talk about uh, uh, what is tsunami and the risk assessment and uh, various components of tsunami early warning system and uh, our activities on uh, uh, risk reduction and resilience in uh, as uh, capacity building programs workshops and then the tsunami ready program which uh, dr sinwas kumar director in kais has mentioned the recent initiative which is very very important now as far as uh, uh building the resilient communities uh, are concerned and also i am going to briefly talk on uh, challenges that we are facing and the initiatives that uh, we have taken up so coming to the 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 uh, tsunami what is tsunami tsunami in uh, japanese means harbor uh, waves because you know that you no know, japanese uh, more frequently no uh, impacted by tsunamis because of the earthquakes that are happening in the pacific uh, uh, ring of fire and generally these ports uh, and uh, harbors in the uh, japan they experience the the waves uh, uh, oscillations in the harbors that's how it is called as a harbor wave otherwise if you see the scientific definition of this uh, tsunami it is a system of ocean gravity waves formed as a result of large scale displacement of sea surface and it, it travels uh, long distances uh, without losing energy so basically the characteristics of the tsunami uh, uh, they uh, they uh, they are long wavelength waves you now which has got uh, wavelengths of uh, about uh, uh, several hundred kilometers and periods of few minutes to about an hour and uh, the tsunami wave uh, uh, travels with the jet speed uh, uh, approximately 500 to 1000 kilometers per hour in deep ocean and uh, it grows uh, to a few tens of meters when it reaches the shore because of the friction that is uh, facing uh, because of the bathymetry and the height of the tsunami wave uh, it, uh, in the open ocean it is less than a meter but as it approaches the coast no depending on the intensity of the the magnitude of the earthquake then it, it may it may rise to uh, a few meters no to tens of meters so if you see this uh, animation like you no know, the basically the causes for uh, tsunami sir uh, the major cause is you no know, the tsunami sir generated by the earthquakes that are happening in the in the, the sea flow so and also tsunamis uh, can be generated by the landslides uh, 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 it's called marine landslides and volcanic eruptions also can create uh, tsunamis one such example is the recent uh, anak 
Anna Krakatov uh, uh, volcano eruption in the Indonesia, which has caused a uh, tsunami, and also uh, meteoroid uh, impacts. And uh, then we also have the, the atypical tsunamis. These are called atypical tsunamis, the tsunamis that are caused by the landslides, submarine landslides, volcanic eruptions, and meteoroid uh, uh, impacts. These are called uh, 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 atypical tsunamis. So generally, uh, 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 deep ocean tsunami, as I mentioned, it has got longer wavelengths, travels uh, fast uh, with small amplitude. Uh, but it doesn't affect uh, uh, ships uh, uh, within the open ocean. But as it approaches, no, it, it creates uh, 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 severe damages uh, to the infrastructure as well as uh, casualties. So, vulnerability of the Indian Ocean uh, coastline for uh, oceanogenic disasters. So, if you see that uh, Indian Ocean, as a, as uh, uh, previous speakers has may have uh, mentioned. That uh, tsunami is, a, is, a, is a, it can impact regional. It is not a, a very specific to certain location, unlike uh, uh, your earthquakes or, uh, uh, or the cyclones. Of course, they are also having uh, uh, impact of a few hundreds to thousands of kilometers. But uh, tsunamis have got impact on the, the basin-wise uh, impact. So, if you see the vulnerability of the Indian Ocean coastline, no Indian Ocean covers 20% of the world oceans area. There are 36 nations and three continents uh, share this coast, and many of them are developing countries. And uh, more than 1.5 billion population lives around these coastal areas. And we have got about 66,500 kilometers coastline. Again, 40% uh, of the global coastline is shared by the Indian Ocean Rim countries. So, and this uh, Indian Ocean, uh, as you know, that most of the coastal areas are uh, low lying and vulnerable to oceano oceanogenic disasters such as uh, tsunamis storm surges and sea level rise due to the climate changes and also uh, uh, indian ocean is the the, the ground for uh, uh, cyclogenesis and 13 percent of the cyclones in the seas around uh, india and the uh, arabian sea or uh, bay of bengal 30 percent of the world cyclones they generate in this uh, region and create uh, 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 damages to the coastline and coming to the indian uh, uh, coastline uh, we have about uh, 64 million uh, uh, people live uh, within 10 meters of low elevation coastal zone, and there are about uh, 3,800 uh, uh, fishing villages. There are about 12 major ports, 200 uh, minor ports, and we also have the fragile ecosystem of uh, mangroves and uh, other ecosystem, approximately 5,000 square kilometers. So these are all highly vulnerable to these oceanogenic uh, 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 disasters. And if you see you now the the tsunamis, no. Uh, there were few events in the past, but we were not aware about those events not till uh, uh, we have witnessed this uh, 2004 uh, uh, tsunami, which has resulted in uh, 2,38,000 casualties, uh, including about uh, 51,000 people were missing, and about 1.5 million people were displaced in 14 countries. And in India, we have about more than 10,000 people, and you have seen the impact uh, that it has created and the loss of lives, which uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan has uh, presented. Nagapatnam being the most uh, uh, impacted uh, uh, area. Uh, coming to the Indian Ocean, uh, we have uh, two potential tsunami zenic uh, zones, uh, uh, which is called uh, Andaman Sumatra subduction zone, which are very active uh, 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 as far as the earthquakes are concerned. And then we have the Makran subduction zone uh, in the Arabian Sea. Where, uh, where earthquakes can uh, trigger tsunamis. As I mentioned, we have some historical tsunamis prior to 2004. There were uh, some earthquake which has generated tsunami in 1881 and then 2004. Then we have uh, uh, earthquakes that have created minor tsunamis you now after uh, 2004. And similarly, there is uh, one earthquake in 1945 in Makran subduction zone, which we have some records, but we are still uh, looking for some more uh, evidences you know, that uh, it has caused a tsunami and uh, uh, created impact on the, the west coast of India and as well as the countries sharing the northwestern Indian Ocean region. So uh, uh, the previous speakers, they have uh, uh, mentioned about the unprecedented uh, damage that uh, uh, December 26, 2004 tsunami, which is called as a Boxing Day tsunami, has created. So uh, um, as uh, mentioned, like, you know, the uh, uh, the tsunami is the worst tsunami ever recorded in the history, and uh, the magnitude is 9.3, uh, which is the second strongest earthquake ever recorded on a seismograph. 
and the earthquake lasted for 10 minutes. Again, it is the longest uh, lasting earthquake in the history. And as I mentioned, we have uh, 2.3 lakh uh, casualties and uh, people, and there is a huge uh, damage to the infrastructure. The reasons for huge loss, if you see, uh, many nations in the Indian Ocean region, we do not know what is tsunami till 2004. And we do not have any preparedness programs in place prior to 2004. And there was no tsunami early, early warning system in India at that time. And also, uh, uh, in uh, ignorance of this natural science uh, uh, no, of tsunami led to inappropriate actions. No. So uh, coming to the risk assessment, no, as I mentioned, we have two tsunamis in uh, zone regions. One is the Andaman Sumatra subduction zone, and the other one is the Makran subduction zone. So depending on the earthquake location and uh, uh, mag uh, magnitude of the, the, the earthquake, no, it takes, you know, if something happens you know, if, uh, in the Andaman Sumatra subduction zone, if the, the uh, uh, earthquake of magnitude more than 6.5, it has a potential to generate tsunami. So if something happens, some earthquake happens in this Andaman Sumatra subduction zone, we have uh, only 20 to 30 minutes time for Andaman and Nicobar Islands, and then we have about the two to three hours time uh, to the mainland of uh, India. And similarly, if uh, uh, some earthquake happens in the Makran subduction zone, which has a potential to generate tsunami, we have only, uh, again, two to three hours uh, time to take any, 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 any measure. So this is, this is the risk that is involved. No, the time available for us is uh, uh, two to three uh, hours, unlike uh, other uh, natural disasters. If you take uh, uh, cyclones, no, we have a lead time of uh, uh, maybe five to 10 days. No, we know that no, there is a cyclogenesis and all, and then uh, there are uh, the, the bulletins or advisories are being issued by the India Meteorological Department. But in case of tsunami, we have only 20, uh, 20 minutes for the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, and then two to three hours uh, uh, for the mainland. So we need to, these are the, 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 the golden hours that are available uh, for us to take uh, uh, measures you know, the, uh, to issue the tsunami bulletins as well as the, the disaster management agencies to take uh, necessary actions to evacuate the coastal population. So uh, recognizing the importance of having an early warning system, uh, the government, in, government of India are uh, interested in the responsibility of uh, setting up of uh, uh, tsunami early warning system in India. Uh, uh, the, the responsibility is given to uh, Ministry of Earth Sciences and uh, uh, in, in, in collaboration with the major uh, uh, participating institutions like India Meteorological Department, National Institute of Oceanography, National Center for uh, Coastal Research, which uh, prior, uh, it was called as uh, Integrated Coastal Marine Area Management, uh, Survey of India, uh, Department of Space through NRIC and uh, uh, ISRO and INCOIS, Ministry of Home Affairs, NDMA and Coastal States. So, uh, 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 Ministry of Health Sciences, INCA is being the uh, 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 national center for providing ocean information services and advisory, national ocean, uh, national center for ocean information and advisory services. The ministry has uh, entrusted the responsibility of uh, setting up of the tsunami early warning system with uh, INCA is. In, COIS, uh, in collaboration with all these uh, national uh, agencies, we have set up this tsunami early warning system. The Indian tsunami early warning system was set up in uh, 2007 to provide uh, uh, early warning uh, uh, for tsunamis. So the tsunami early warning system uh, 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 comprises no uh, different components. The first thing is the ocean, uh, the observing networks to detect the earthquakes, you know, where we have the seismic network, which I'm going to uh, talk uh, briefly. And then we have the sea level network, which has got uh, tsunami buoys and uh, tide gauges for monitoring the sea levels. And uh, we also have the communication uh, uh, channels you know, to uh, get this data in real time. We use uh, various uh, uh, communication modes you know, to receive this data in real time. We use VSAT connectivities, you know, we use INSAT communication, we use GPRS, INMARSAT to get this data from the uh, observing network. And then we also have the modeling component you now where uh, we need to see once uh, there is an earthquake which has uh, a potential to generate tsunami, then uh, we have, uh, by taking the observations, you know, then uh, we have to run the models and then we have to provide information on the, 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 the wave arrivals and the amplitude of the wave that is uh, reaching at the different uh, coastal points. So we have uh, bathymetry, topography, and then models you know, to uh, get this information. And uh, other component which is very important as far as tsunami risk reduction and resilience is concerned, uh, and also uh, the connecting with the, the communities, the stakeholders is like the capacity building. 
uh, to understand our uh, uh, bulletins and to take uh, uh, necessary measures for the, the evacuation uh, uh, in case of uh, there is any tsunami. And also we have a strong component of research and development you know, to understand uh, 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 the challenges that, are, uh, that we are facing in understanding the, 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 the behavior of the tsunami. So then we also have a, a strong R&D components uh, for understanding the paleo tsunami modeling and uh, utilization of the data that are coming from the state of the art uh, uh, observing networks. And uh, then uh, we have uh, tsunami uh, warnings. And this is the Tsunami Early Warning Center, which was uh, set up uh, at Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services in uh, uh, 2007. We are operational uh, uh, from uh, October 2007. And the center is operated on 24 bar 7. And we receive uh, heterogeneous uh, uh, data from a variety of sensors, as I mentioned, seismic network, the, the sea level network. And then we acquire the data. We process it and then analyze it and then generate uh, advisories and uh, uh, dissemination. As Director Nikois has mentioned, we have the state of the art uh, information and communication technology. We have high-end high -end computing facilities to uh, receive, process, and uh, analyze, and then uh, provide these uh, uh, tsunami advisories uh, to the stakeholders. And uh, coming to the seismic network, which is very important component of the observing network, you know, the, we start uh, acting on, uh, uh, there is an earthquake, so the seismic network, we're continuously monitoring uh, the earthquakes that are happening all over the globe. Uh, and we receive the data from uh, real-time seismic monitoring network of 17 broadband seismic stations set up by India Meteorological Department. Now it is looked after by the National Center for uh, Seismology, as well as we have the research network from uh, about uh, 100 stations also that are uh, coming in real time. And we also receive the data from about 400 international stations in real time. And you see these are the stations that we receive data in real time. And uh, these triangles are the seismic uh, stations. And the color of the seismic uh, uh, station, the cyan, indicates the latency of the data that is coming in real time. Cyan means we are receiving the data within uh, 20 seconds. So in real time, we are getting. And then the different colors shows that uh, latency of the data that is coming into the uh, tsunami early warning system. And we also have different softwares like uh, Syscomp and Bulletin Hydra to acquire, process, and auto-locate the, uh, the location of the earthquake, and then uh, issue the bulletins. So this, this, this is a very important component of the uh, tsunami early warning system, where uh, we monitor the earthquakes that are happening in all over the, the globe. So the next uh, uh, observing uh, uh, component is uh, sea level network, where we have uh, seven tsunami buoys deployed by Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services as well as National Institute of Ocean Technology, our sister concern under uh, Ministry of Earth Sciences, which is at Chennai. We, we jointly, we have uh, set up this tsunami buoy network in the Indian Ocean, uh, particularly in the Bay of Bengal region, where we have the, uh, the, the potential tsunami zenic zones, like Andaman Sumatra subduction zone and then uh, Makran subduction zone. The tsunami buoys basically, they confirm if there is an earthquake which, has generated, uh, which generates the tsunami, the buoy network will confirm that, no, it has generated tsunami. So the uh, buoys, they transmit data in real time uh, uh, on the sea level. If there is, uh, in normal cases, it routinely monitors the sea level. And if there is any, any, any earthquake that has triggered the tsunami, then it gets into the tsunami mode. And then we, we come to know that, you know, uh, that S, yes, the earthquake has generated the tsunami. So when it comes to the, the coastal uh, region, to confirm that you no know, the tsunami wave arrived, uh, so we have set up these uh, sea level stations uh, jointly with the uh, Survey of India earlier, and now we are uh, managing this entire network. So we have uh, set up 36 tide gauges all along the Indian coast, basically, to confirm that as if it, if it has generated the tsunami, the, the sea level network will confirm that as it has, uh, the tsunami waves uh, arrived at uh, different coastal, po coastal uh, points, and also it confirms that on the arrival of the uh, arrival time of the wave, as well as uh, it also gives us uh, the height of the tsunami that uh, uh, reached at uh, different points of course. So in addition to our national uh, uh, tsunami network, we also receive uh, 300 uh, uh, stations, uh, tide gauge stations data in real time. Because as I mentioned, tsunami is not a local phenomena, it is a global phenomena. So we need to have more and more data to get conformity on that, know that uh, tsunami has arrived. And also we share, uh, we receive uh, data from uh, uh, 50 international tsunami buoys, uh, which are in the, in the Indian Ocean uh, deployed by other countries as well as the global uh, ocean. 
So this sea level network will basically confirm that now the, the earthquake has generated tsunami and also it uh, uh, tells about that uh, the, uh, the confirmation on the tsunami that is arriving at uh, different uh, points. So the next uh, component of uh, tsunami early warning system is uh, the model modeling, ocean modeling, which I have mentioned. So, so we uh, we cannot run the models in re real time if uh, there is an earthquake which has a potential to generate tsunami. Uh, we cannot uh, run the model because we can run, but uh, it takes some time. But uh, the time which I have mentioned, uh, only two to three hours. So we need to uh, give the information uh, with the, the 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 minimum possible time. That is uh, uh, within ten minutes. We are we are supposed to provide the information on uh, whether it is going to generate tsunami or not. So I'll explain on the bulletins that are going uh, that the tsunami early warning center is issuing. But when it comes to the modeling component, now we run these uh, models uh, for uh, for uh, 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 these uh, uh, subduction regions, and uh, uh, we have about 1,400 uh, unit sources of 100 by 50 kilometer area representing these ruptures uh, of uh, earthquake magnitude 7.5 slip as uh, one meter. So we have generated a, a scenario database. It is called Open Ocean uh, uh, Propagation Scenario Databases for this particular uh, 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 magnitude of earthquake. And uh, we have about 50,000 scenarios which we have generated and uh, uh, and our uh, decision support system can pick the right scenario uh, uh, if there is an earthquake and then uh, issue the, 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 uh, the advisories uh, for the 4,380 coastal forecast points. Now these are different bulletins you know, that uh, the threat maps and uh, 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 what uh, we, we have uh, generated using the the, the the ocean model. Similarly, we also have uh, uh, earthquakes that are happening in the, the other oceans like Pacific or Atlantic. And uh, for that, we have not generated the uh, uh, scenario database, but we can run uh, the model in real time if, uh, if there is an earthquake that has a potential to generate tsunami in the other oceans like Pacific or uh, Atlantic. So that we can give uh, uh, in operationally, we can run and provide. Of course, we have uh, initiated uh, uh, R and D, and we have experimented uh, successfully for uh, running the model in real time. Uh, 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 and uh, we are going to make it uh, uh, operational soon, where we can uh, give in addition to the tsunami arrival uh, times, the amplitudes. We, in addition to that, we also can give uh, uh, extent of uh, coastal inundation caused by uh, tsunamis or storm surges. So that has been successfully. We have uh, experimented, and uh, soon we are going to make it operational. So we'll be the first country to uh, provide uh, such information. And uh, 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 once we have uh, located uh, this earthquake and there is a potential to generate tsunami, then we have a standard operating procedure in place, which we have uh, uh, developed uh, jointly with uh, based on the NDMA guidelines. So uh, generally, the Indian Tsunami Early Warning Center uh, issues the, the tsunami bulletins. No. Uh, if the earthquake is uh, uh, magnitude is more than 6.5, uh, uh, which happens in the Indian Ocean region, and uh, uh, if it is more than 8.0 uh, outside Indian Ocean region. So based on this uh, magnitude, we have developed the standard operating procedure. And if there is an earthquake of uh, more than 6.5, tsunami uh, uh, warning center, based on the seismic uh, data that is coming uh, into the system, so if it is more than uh, 6.5, we issue the first bulletin that there is a potential to generate tsunami. And then uh, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we, we use the open ocean uh, uh, propagation scenario database. And if it has got a gen, uh, potential to generate tsunami, and then we issue the second bulletin uh, uh, with uh, additional information on the, the threat level. So we also have uh, uniquely designed the SOP for uh, near source region, for uh, particularly Andaman and Nicobar Islands and far source region like uh, uh, mainland. So if the, uh, uh, the earthquake has a potential to generate tsunami and uh, uh, the model run scenario tells that the estimated time is less than 16 minutes, then uh, the wave height is uh, greater than two. So then we issue the uh, warning to the near source regions and 0.5 to two meters, we issue the alert. 0.2 to 0.5, we issue uh, watch. Uh, these are the threat uh, levels that we issue in uh, the, the advice. And similarly, for uh, far regions, like you now there is a slight change. You now, if it is more than two meters and the estimated time of arrival is more than 60 minutes, we issue the alert and watch. So then subsequently, uh, after the second uh, bulletin, then we start uh, looking into the observational data that is coming from the sea level network. And then we include 
the information that are coming from this observational network like tsunami buoy if they uh, generated tsunami then we add this information and subsequently if there is any 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 update on the the earthquake magnitude and all that also we take into consideration and revise the bulletins and then issue bulletins again updated bulletins uh, similarly so generally the sop what uh, based on the sop what is the public response and threat levels you know what we uh, put in the bulletins so if the, we issue the the warning uh, means that is uh, the estimated uh, uh, tsunami uh, arrival and amplitude if it is more than 2 meters no then we issue the warning then uh, if it is 0.2 to 2, uh, 0.5 to 2 meters we issue the the alert uh, and then uh, watch this uh, gives us you now what are the uh, action to be taken and uh, where uh, we disseminate this information to like you know the minister of Health sciences minister of home affairs uh, national ndma and uh, ndrf and then uh, uh, sdmas and then uh, similarly so then what uh, uh, people have to do so the 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 bulletins also will include you know what uh, 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 each threat means so if it is warning then they have to evacuate the beaches and go and if it is alert then we have to look forward uh, uh basically to evacuate the beaches and then if it is a watch you no know, just wait for uh, further information and we keep on looking into the observational data and uh, uh, then we see that you no know, the observational data we feel that you know, if it is less than uh, uh, 0.5 meters and all then uh, we issue the threat cost uh, uh, bulletins so we have a, a, a decision support system uh, which was developed in house to uh, to issue the bulletins based on the standard operating procedures so the decision support system will capture all the real time data that is coming from the the seismic stations and then does the situation analysis using the open ocean uh, uh, propagation scenario database and then uh, uh, issue the bulletins now, as i mentioned in the previous uh, slides and also it does the observational analysis and issue the subsequent uh, bulletins this is uh, developed in house and then based on the sop it uh, uh, takes the observations and then issue the uh, advisory uh, this is the typical uh, 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 example of the tsunami bulletin for uh, 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 any event you know, that has uh, potential to generate tsunami. As I mentioned, the first bulletin we issue with uh, only the, the magnitude of uh, earthquake and uh, uh, the potential to generate tsunami and wait for the subsequent bulletins. And in the sub second uh, bulletin, uh, we use the open ocean uh, uh, propagation scenario database and then we issue the travel time maps and the threat level maps. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we give the, the threat status for uh, uh, whatever I have mentioned about 4,000 plus coastal forecast points. So we give the precise information on, uh, on the which coastal forecast point falls under watch, alert, or uh, uh, warning uh, uh, threat. So then we uh, issue these uh, products using a variety of uh, communication modes. We use the fax, email, SMS, web, GTS. So, uh, and also uh, we issue the bulletins to uh, other countries in the Indian Ocean region. So, bulletins are issued at national level to various agencies like MHA, NDMEA, MOS, NDRF, IMD, CWC, and all state level we issue to the SDMEAs, and at district level also we issue the uh, district emergency operation uh, 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 centers. And also we have some critical installations along the coast, like you now the atomic uh, power plants and uh, there are uh, ports and harbors no we we directly disseminate the information to these critical installations along the coast so now we are also planning to uh, adopt the latest technologies in the in the, in the ICT uh, and we are trying to integrate the uh, we have developed an integrated dissemination system which is going to be operational soon where uh, we are going to use uh, 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 latest technologies in addition to our conventional uh, communication modes like you know where which i have mentioned uh, fax email and sms in, in addition to that one mobile app social media interactive voice response system electronic display boards uh, radio and tv broadcast and uh, cloud channels so this is also uh, in the final stages and we are going to be operational so so uh, another important aspect which i have mentioned uh, andaman and nicobar islands uh, uh, we have only 20 to 30 minutes time so we need to have direct connectivity with the Andaman and uh, Nicobar Islands, you know, where we have established a special communication uh, mode. It's called VSAT Aided Emergency Communication Systems. Uh, we have set up uh, these VSAT based VOIP phone and fax at some seven uh, emergency operation uh, centers in Andaman Nicobar Islands, uh, where we have set up, uh, we have also set up the electronic display boards and also some application uh, uh, for them uh, to get on earthquake alerts. So we, we, we have been providing the information. Uh, 
immediately uh, to the uh, Andaman and Nicobar Islands, you know, as soon as uh, there is an earthquake and uh, there is a potential to generate tsunami. So, as uh, Director Inkais has mentioned, you know, we, are, uh, we have been working flawless uh, uh, since uh, uh, the Tsunami Warning Center uh, was operational since uh, 2007. So, as on today, we have monitored one, not one, 101 tsunami xenic earthquakes, as I mentioned, more than 6.5 in the Indian Ocean. And out of uh, 101 uh, earthquake events in the Indian Ocean region, so there are uh, uh, seven earthquakes have uh, potential to generate tsunami and where we have issued uh, uh, bulletins you know, on uh, tsunami uh, uh, warnings. So these are the seven uh, earthquakes where we have issued the bulletins, where we have given the, the information on uh, uh, tsunami threat information to different coastal focus points. So these uh, seven indicates, you now of course, these seven have uh, not generated any major tsunamis, but uh, there were some minor uh, tsunamis at different uh, locations. I'm not going to read the, the table, but uh, uh, we, have, we have been uh, working uh, flawlessly and we have never given any false alarm to the country. And uh, one of these seven events is on uh, 11th April 2007, where we have an earthquake of magnitude 8.5 uh, in the northern Sumatra earthquake, really tested our uh, efficiency and efficacy of our uh, uh, tsunami early warning systems uh, to get the data and then to provide uh, uh, bulletins. So there was an earthquake of 8.7. We have issued the first bulletin and uh, within eight minutes and and within the next eight minutes, we have issued the second bulletin with uh, the information on which are the, the coastal focus points you know, that are uh, going to be uh, under warning, watch or alerts. Now, this is how we have issued these bulletins. Uh, and uh, subsequently, uh, Bulletin 3, we have also started receiving uh, data from these uh, tsunami buoys and uh, then uh, the sea level network. You can see this, uh, this is the tsunami buoy uh, STB01, which is near the Sumatra uh, region, which has uh, confirmed that as it has generated tsunami and of course it is a minor. So it has confirmed, observing system has confirmed, then the sea level network uh, near to the, the source region also have confirmed that yes, it has generated tsunami, but it is minor. So we have given the qualitative and quantitative uh, 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 warning uh, status to very precisely to the coastal focus points, like you know uh, these uh, uh, coastal focus zones, you know, where we said that only three islands, you know, initially under uh, uh, warning, and of course subsequently uh, we have updated uh, based on the uh, further information that we have received from the seismic data as well as the observational network. We have updated that only two uh, islands in the uh, Andaman and Nicobar Islands are under warning, remaining are under uh, alert or watch. So we also have uh, uh, tsunami early warnings uh, issued by Indonesian tsunami early warning system, Japan uh, uh, giant Australian tsunami early warning system, Pacific tsunami early warning uh, center, and Japan Meteorological Agency. So, but if you see that, you know, they have given uh, um, broadly and uh, basin-wide uh, evacuation, but whereas we have given the qualitative and quantitative uh, uh, information, and in conformity with the, the observations that uh, we have come. So this, as I mentioned, has really tested our efficiency and efficacy of our uh, uh, center. And of course, uh, then uh, uh, our disaster management agencies also have acted uh, very apt and uh, taken necessary actions uh, to uh, disseminate this information uh, uh, to the, the stakeholders and uh, then take uh, necessary actions. So, uh, uh, in addition to serving a uh, country, as uh, Derek Inkais has mentioned, uh, uh, Indian Tsunami Early Warning Center also has been uh, designated as a regional tsunami service provided by the Intergovernmental uh, Coordination Group of Indian Ocean Tsunami Early Warning uh, Sy Tsunami Warning and Mitigation System uh, as part of Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, UNESCO. We have been designated uh, in uh, 2011 as a tsunami uh, service provider in addition to the Indonesia and Australia. So we are responsible Hello, for sir. providing this uh, early warning. Hello, yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Sir. Yes, sir. Sorry to interrupt you due to time constraint. We are exceeding yeah. uh, short of time, sir. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm almost uh, another few slides. Okay. Okay, okay, I'm I'm done. So we have been provided. Yeah, we are uh, providing this. Uh, uh, services to other 25 countries also. And uh, as I mentioned, now, uh, uh, as, as a regional service provider, we have to uh, provide the services and uh, so, uh, Indian Ocean Tsunami Warning System has uh, developed the key performance indicators now of all these uh, GSPs. They have uh, set up some uh, key performance indicators. 
so we are well within this uh, uh, we have been uh, doing well and we are well within this key performance uh, indicators the tsunami warning center has been doing very well and as i mentioned in addition to the indian ocean we also have uh, monitored 521 stations uh, across the globe uh, uh, another important aspect of uh, tsunami risk reduction is like you no know, communication tests uh, uh, the, the, when it comes to the tsunami preparedness and response, no, we have been continuously and regularly uh, conducting the communication tests, the SOP workshops, tabletop exercises, and mock drills uh, for uh, sensitizing these uh, stakeholders of uh, various uh, disaster management agencies. So this uh, shows that you no, know, that uh, as part of our capacity building activities, we are organizing uh, workshops, trainings to uh, all the stakeholders, and also we have prepared the awareness materials uh, for easy understanding of this. Uh, 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 stakeholders as well as the uh, coastal community and we conduct the regular workshops and then uh, create awareness and in addition to that one uh, we also regularly conduct communication tests to test the uh, uh, communication modes so every year we conduct twice this uh, communication tests and to uh, see that how communication channels are uh, working and also we analyze you now which mode of uh, communication tests are uh, uh, doing well and if there are any challenges you now we try to address those things so another important aspect which Dr. Radhakrishnan has mentioned now connecting the mock drills. So Tsunami Early Warning Center conducts the mock drills at national level and uh, regional level uh, every year. Uh, uh, two such great examples are like you now in 2017, we have conducted a mega mock exercise jointly with the MHA and uh, NDMA where uh, all coastal states have participated and uh, about one lakh uh, people were evacuated due, during this exercise. And uh, once in two years, the Indian Ocean Tsunami Warning Center, uh, Indian Ocean Tsunami Warning System also conducts the mock drill at uh, regional level. And 2018, we have conducted the uh, regional level mock drill where uh, we have about uh, 46, 44 districts along eight coastal states have participated in the thing. Again, we have about more than uh, one lakh people who are evacuated. And uh, we have uh, uh, IOA of 20 tsunami mark exercise on 20th, uh, uh, on 13th and uh, 20th October 2020. Due to uh, Corona pandemic, we are not doing the the full scale uh, mock exercise, but it is limited to uh, only to test the communication uh, 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 tests with the uh, disaster management agencies. Of course, we have now already issued the letters, and probably will be uh, uh, sending uh, letters to the all the state uh, uh, disaster management agencies. So another important aspect uh, when it comes to the risk assessment and uh, uh, hazard assessment, we also developed a multi-hazard early warning, uh, multi-hazard vulnerability mapping of the coast for uh, various disasters where we have used a variety of the data. We have developed a multi-hazard multi vulnerability map for the entire Indian coast, and then we have identified nine highly vulnerable uh, areas and then generated the TDGIS mapping where we have uh, uh, also included the socioeconomic uh, data. Uh, uh, where you know the uh, the people living in uh, uh, in uh, individual uh, uh, level information is also built into this uh, 3D GIS mapping, and then 3D GIS mapping we use it uh, using the tsunami model we have integrated with the tsunami model, and then we can precisely tell that which are the areas that are going to be inundated, extent of inundation, and then uh, what is the uh, risk assessment at building level uh, uh, of this uh, 3D GIS. You now we can provide. And also, it will uh, uh, give the socio-economic risk of the tsunamis, you know, uh, which are the buildings are at very high risk, uh, uh, very high, high, moderate, and low risk. So uh, then we can it, it can also help in uh, coastal risk assessment at uh, building level. So this is how, and this can be uh, used. This information can be used for uh, uh, preparing the evacuation maps. You now where uh, 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 we are uh, uh, now uh, in, uh, promoting the implementation of tsunami ready program. Uh, as the director has mentioned now, uh, uh, IOC UNESCO has come up with an innovative uh, uh, concept called Tsunami Ready Program, which is a community performance based program. And uh, it is mainly to improve the coastal community's preparedness for the tsunami emergencies and minimize the loss of life and property. So, uh, Indian Ocean Tsunami Warning uh, System has uh, devised uh, 11 indicators. And if the communities they made these 11 indicators, then they will be recognized as a uh, Tsunami ready communities. As director has mentioned, Orissa State Disaster Management as uh, uh, Disaster Management Authority has implemented this uh, tsunami ready program on six villages during the IOI 18 exercise. Of course, uh, tsunami there is there is a national board uh, set up by uh, Ministry of Health Sciences. Then uh, this national board uh, visited two villages of the uh, uh, six, and then uh, 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 since they have met all these uh, uh, requirements of these 11 indicators, no national board has recommended. Uh, to IOC UNESCO for uh, recognition at the national uh, level. So these are the 11 indicators now that uh, two villages uh, of uh, Odisha 
uh, Venkat Raipur uh, from Ganyam district and Nolia Sahi from uh, Jagasingpur district. They have uh, implemented the tsunami ready indicators and then they have been uh, recognized by UNESCO IOC as the tsunami ready communities. So the recognition doesn't mean that they are uh, uh, tsunami proof, but it is mere an acknowledgement for their efforts you know, on the tsunami preparedness of the community and their awareness and what are the steps they have to take uh, if uh, in case of any event of uh, tsunami. So we are now trying to promote uh, this uh, uh, tsunami ready program. We want to extend this uh, tsunami ready program and bring uh, greater participation from the coastal communities in collaboration with the uh, disaster management uh, authority, national level and uh, at local level. So now we are uh, going to take uh, capacity building uh, trainings and workshop uh, for all the stakeholders to extend this program. So this is my last slide. Uh, so having uh, said that now we have uh, the best tsunami early warning system in the world as director has mentioned, where we have the state of the art uh, uh, technology, you know, as far as observations are concerned, modeling is concerned and ICT infrastructure is concerned. So uh, as uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan has uh, posed that now, we, we, we are now well equipped. Uh, I'm sure that now we are well equipped and to get the early warnings you know, uh, based on uh, the infrastructure that we have uh, developed. But still, there uh, remain some challenges, you know, like if you have seen the recent uh, uh, tsunamis, which are called typical tsunamis caused uh, uh, tsunami in the Palu, which is uh, because of the submarine landslides, which is an airfield tsunami, and also the volcanic eruptions and all. And we have some challenges in the modeling results you know, where we have some estimation of uh, overestimation and underestimation. And uh, we are addressing these challenge challenges based on our new initiatives. We have uh, like you no know, increasing the uh, sensor networks, we are enhancing our modeling, which I have mentioned, and then uh, the 3DGS, which I have mentioned, uh, we are enhancing the communication systems, and also we are coming up with the multi-hazard early warning systems, you know, where uh, coastal inundation is common, so we are going to have multi-hazard early warning system, both for storm surges and as well as uh, uh, tsunamis. And also we have various uh, R&D components uh, uh, to address these challenges. So. Uh, with this, I end my talk, and uh, thanks for uh, giving me this opportunity. I thank uh, NDM, NIDM, and uh, 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 Executive Director as well as Professor Surya Prakash. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your presentation. Uh, sir, highlighted the role of tsunami risk reduction and resilience by discussing the vulnerability of Indian coastal states of. Uh, to tsunami and mentioned about uh, two major subduction zones that may cause tsunami for India that is Andaman Sumatra subduction zone and uh, Makran subduction zone. He talked about the initiative taken by the government of India to disseminate early warning system for tsunami. Sir enlightened about the modules of the tsunami early warning system developed by INCOIS and major initiative taken by INCOIS namely Indian Ocean Tsunami Ready Program for enhancing the coping capacity of coastal communities to tackle tsunami. The tsunami ready program has been successfully completed in two villages of Odisha. Uh, thank you very much sir for brainstorming lecture. Now I would like to invite Professor Surya Prakash to share his view and experience. Professor Surya Prakash is the head of geometrological risk management division uh, of NIDM and is in charge of three specialized center. He was associated with various prestigious institutions such as CBRI, IIT Roorkee, JNU, Vadia Institute of Himalayan Geology, FRI, VIT. He has also published several national and international research publications, book, articles, etc. in some of the high impact factor journals. Professor Sujith, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Harjit. Uh, am I audible? Okay, we are already over time. So let me just briefly say that my previous speakers actually have covered a good amount of uh, the information related to how the tsunami had affected and how we responded. Plus uh, the information regarding signs of uh, tsunami in addition to how we are monitoring and issuing early warning systems and performing at the international levels. I'll just uh, go through, uh, basically being an earth scientist, uh, that uh, uh, just uh, sharing the artistic picture, first of all. Uh, first, when I visited Japan, uh, we had a collaboration with Japanese on earthquake, tsunami, and landslides. And uh, this is the first image I came across there from an artist called Hokusai, 
who created a wave of a very huge height uh, during the uh, Kanagawa earthquake and tsunami. Now, causes my friend, uh, Dr. Mr. Patabi Rao, has already mentioned to you, uh, can be many. In fact, uh, most of us think uh, mostly about uh, earthquake and uh, volcanoes, but there are landslides which had actually caused uh, tsunamis of the highest waves that had been ever generated on this earth. So I'll just tell you about that. And basically understanding about uh, the science of occurrence of the earthquake uh, within the oceanic environment, we have uh, two types of basically uh, plates on this earth called oceanic plate and continental plate. There are plates which are also hybrid plates, which have both oceanic as well as continental elements. And uh, these uh, plates are always moving, as you know, because of different types of plate margins, which are divergent, convergent, and uh, parallel plate margins, which are having stack slip faults and movements, which called as transform boundaries. And there, these movements are happening because of the uh, convection currents, which are cells, which are established within the asthenosphere of the earth, you can see uh, uh, briefly at this picture. So I'm trying to make you understand why these tsunamis are actually an endogenic process, which cannot be prevented, which are inevitable. However, the uh, consequences can be prevented. And the consequences are that when this, uh, 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 the plate movements occur, the displacement of the uh, rocks happens, and that results into movement of the heavy mass of water over, over, above and above them. So this upliftment of the water uh, body above them actually results in formation of sinusoidal waves. So at one part it is high, which we call as crest, and there is another part which is where the wave will be low. So it is termed as trough. So these uh, uh, sinusoidal uh, characters of Traps and crust actually are very much indicative of the possibility of occurrence of a tsunami in any region. And this knowledge actually has led to safety of lives at many places. I'll just give you some of those examples where uh, this had happened. But let me also clarify that this crest and trough phenomena is variable depending on the topography of the area. So it may be the trough first arriving towards the coast or the crest. So the crest and trough will variable. However, the mostly it is the trough region which arrives first during the tsunami periods. And this is uh, showing just that when uh, the wave actually amplitude is indicator of the energy of the wave. So when it comes closer uh, to the shorelines, the wave heights increases, where at the, the mid of the ocean, the wave height is less because of the water volume. So the wave height actually increases multifold when it comes towards the coast and the shorelines, and that results in higher impacts of the tsunami. So I was just telling you the highest wave that entered, uh, happened uh, in a tsunami, happened in Alaska at Litua Way when a terrestrial landslide happened, and it went into the sea and raised a wave of almost about 525 meter, the highest ever recorded tsunami. So this is somehow called as atypical, but submarine landslide and terrestrial landslide along the coast can cause bigger landslides even more larger than the earthquakes. In Indian Ocean, uh, this has been mentioned by our director, so I'll not repeat it the coastline of 7,516 meter, kilometers, and uh, the Indian Ocean tsunami also discussed. So let me escape this uh, slide. But however, as a geoscientist, I would like to point you out that uh, when I'm talking about tectonic plates, tectonic plates of a variable size also, not only in terms of their oceanic, continental, and hybrid plates, can having both the constituents, but also different sizes. So in our Indian Ocean, uh, when the tsunami, Indian Ocean tsunami took place, actually the Indian plate, the Burmese plate, micro plate, and the Eurasian plate, there is a triple junction, and an earthquake happened at that. And that was the biggest ever earthquake happened at this particular location. 
so caused a major tsunami and the tsunami impacts we have you have seen uh, several impacts in terms of uh, damages to lives economy and infrastructure but the environment also gets affected and the corals and the water bodies and the aquatic life the marine life also gets affected which are close to that area so we have to look into that also so i'm just showing you some of the picture of the coral life and the uh, marine life were affected and even the forest the forest the fisheries the agriculture the laborers uh, and the fishermen they are the most affected and during the tsunami periods and mangroves also got affected they are not only affected but also were as life savers at some any of the places uh, they have actually saved many of the lives because of a barrier they created against the tsunami waves so we have to learn about the environmental condition other is that whenever the uh, tsunami takes place it actually brings lot of sea water into the ground that Uh, territorial uh, uh, lands and this actually uh, pollutes the groundwater also sea water intrusion with groundwater actually contaminates the water and creates problems for drinking water supplies and also the sea and dunes uh, dr radha krishna mentioned that are also uh, act as protective barriers just like the mangroves so we should not remove them when they are existing close to the coast areas and they can serve as Uh, one of the barriers to reduce the impact tsunami risk reduction is ultimately the approach that we have to adopt the simulation the maps the tsunami warning system and assessing the exposure of the coastal community with respect to the hazard and vulnerability is very much important uh, mr patabi rao actually showed you some of the maps that how the building stocks the infrastructure are likely to get exposed to different kind of tsunami environment close to the oceans and what would be the distance up to which the tsunami water can affect has to be also estimated well based on bathymetry topography and the magnitude and severity of the tsunami so how can we avoid is going to the high ground uh, slowing the water currents by putting the barriers in between i will show you some of my experiences that i had uh, when uh, we had interacted with the japanese after the sunday uh, uh, tsunami that happened uh, in 2011 11th march in the miyagi prefecture uh, you know that uh, tsunami actually had killed several like uh, of people and uh, this is uh, the the structure how they can be actually their impact can be mitigated in terms of blockade against the tsunami forces so design and construction of new buildings to minimize tsunami damage so now we know that which are those areas and how much is the level and impact of the energy of the tsunami waves and the likely damages based on our past experiences so we can try to build new structures with the tsunami resistant designs and for this we can use our indian uh, standards codes or international codes and reducing the impacts of those forces in various ways so our engineers are well trained into this they know that we need to actually not only protect the superstructure but also the foundations of the buildings so buildings protection and both so with the ground as well as of the superstructure is very very important in terms of forces against the because of tsunami so protecting the existing developments because uh, only new structures you can construct with new disaster resistant design but the existing structures also you, uh, need to be protected so we build to uh, have to build some infrastructure like uh, the sea walls or the break uh, waters uh, barriers or some other structures which i will sharing with you how we can do and also in case we cannot uh, uh, create the, uh, reduce those impacts then evacuation is the only option so evacuation and safe routes and shelters also to be planned through our disaster management plans as also indicated by dr radha krishnan ji tsunami early warning system is already in now place and we are performing well as said by our friend from inquest and uh, director inquest so the least expensive and most important mitigation efforts is 
education training and capacity development because as said by our uh, friends from inquest also until unless community is aware and prepared we cannot save lives so education training and capacity development through sensitization and awareness is the key and i will cite to some of the examples from the uh, 2004 uh, tsunami that uh, uh, i can cite you from various uh, places uh, this guy from uh, sri lanka who was a first uh, seaman actually is experienced in uh, tsunami earlier in chile uh, could save several lives hundreds of lives in a village where he lived from sri lanka uh, galpokha where uh, there is another nearby places uh, almost 70 to 90% of the population was abolished all of you must have heard about the girl student uh, tilly smith from britain who was at that time 10 years old whose uh, teacher has actually told in her geography class that when the tsunami occurs there is a residual of the sea uh, and you can see the sea bed and uh, the beach beyond a normal extent and she informed the the uh, you no know, pilgrims tourist on the, the beach side in thailand and uh, several hundreds of uh, the lives could be saved because of that information similar there was an incident uh, in indonesia also where uh, there was a traditional knowledge available with the indonesian villagers and one of the boy who was playing close to the beach anto surya anto he informed that uh, there is a likelihood of uh, tsunami and then all the villagers went upside and um, there was least casualty the almost no college casualty in that particular village compared to all other uh, villages so there are many such instances even our uh, people jarwa tribe uh, in andaman they also use their traditional indigenous knowledge to protect themselves against the tsunami so these are the things that we have to learn from our traditional knowledge and also technological knowledge just uh, some of the views i am sharing that i learned from uh, japan they, they because pacific ocean we have maximum numbers of earthquake and also the tsunami and the pacific tsunami warning center is one of the oldest one in fact when the indian ocean tsunami took place uh, 10 minutes after the indian ocean tsunami uh, they did not feel the likelihood of the uh, tsunami to happen after that earthquake but later on they realized and they passed on that information to different countries in the indian ocean however that was a bit late and many of the people actually got trapped and affected and in japan numerous records and casualties have happened because of tsunami and in japan also there is an old story that a villager in a village actually saw a bay back a landslide the tsunami and uh, he put fire and in alerted all other villagers and that way he could save many of the lives so there can be traditional ways in which we can alert people not only the technological means as the uh, japan meteorological agency monitors and informs this and they have also a good communication system also so communication is equally important besides the forecast and early warning system to reach timely to the people who are likely to get affected and also the infrastructures on the way uh, uh, from the uh, structures or the infrastructure to the sea tidal gates tsunami bay mouth breakwaters sea walls these are all structures which has been created i'll show you after the uh, sandai tsunami in 2011 i had the opportunity to, to revisit those areas i visited those areas in 2008 and 2015 again so those areas they had actually developed the tsunami countermeasure plan as part of their local disaster uh, prevention plan and they had prepared their communities well they had discussed with their communities and that's why the communities were well aware and they could save themselves and uh, tsunami disaster forecasting manual as well as database uh, in terms of inundation because of tsunami was also prepared and each coastal area the evacuation routes were also well uh, decided and informed to the people depending on the wave height arrival time appearance and damages 
so these manuals we need to develop in our country also uh, this is uh, the kind of situation uh, immediately after the tsunami that water from the seaside had come and actually all the buildings were surrounded with huge amounts of water from where the people could not come out but they went upside some of the uh, areas where the industries were also there this is one of the slow, uh, area where the which uh, was an industrial town in japan also got affected during the sandai tsunami uh, which was a triple disaster and this was the area which was there uh, after the tsunami had occurred so you can see uh, most of the infrastructure around this area actually got lost i'm showing you the picture before the previous picture was after the tsunami and this was the picture just before the tsunami so you can see how much structures were there uh, in the previous sector you can see all those structures were lost the same bridge and same location the same pictures and they kept all these memories and created memorials field memorials and also kept posters around that mentioning that these are the areas which were affected and how many people and how did they save their lives also so in the uh, our country also i think we have to have field museums and uh, our uh, uh, practices uh, to make the memorials of our uh, major disaster events so that uh, the people can revisit and relearn and do not forget the past consequences this was the temple upside to which the people had actually run up to save their lives and many of those people who were living to that uh, seaside which i had shown you in the previous picture actually saved life now this is the situation which is now uh, at the sites that they had built barriers and in between they have also planted trees like the one which uh, i am telling you in our india we are uh, having mangroves and these are the walls you can see on the other sides uh, this these are the walls and these are the barriers and these are the trees which have been erected so multiple barriers and blockades have been created for tsunami waters to enter the inland areas and affect the structures and also created temporary uh, bathrooms toilets and other facilities in case the uh, normal facilities get affected they have also used uh, to tetrapods like structures to inaccessible areas where wall building is not possible to actually break the energy of the uh, tsunami waves and uh, this is one of another place where 3000 homes were built along with facilities and they had also shown uh, what was the impact the photographs up and down is actually showing this uh, place before and after the tsunami so that people do not forget and they keep all the information in the form of a poster at those sites so these are another place so many of those places which i visited after the sandai tsunami in 2011 i found that they are offering all the information that how the city get developed and how this 2011 earthquake and tsunami it affected those buildings and later on rebuilding has been done to prevent the risks so with these words i thank you all and uh, i request uh, the moderator to kindly take up the questions uh, thank you sir for highlighting various as tsunami sir rightly pointed out the tsunami is not only destroy human life but have a devastating effect on insects animal plants natural resources and infrastructure as tsunami changes the landscape now we will take some questions raised by our participants due to time constraint we will restrict ourselves to only two or three questions the first question is for dr patabi sir are you there uh, sir the question uh, is raised by dr shashil uh, sushil gupta does incoes prepared probabilistic tsunami hazard inundation maps for various recent period like 25 years 50 years and so on Uh, uh, as i mentioned we have uh, only uh, developed the multi hazard vulnerability mapping but now we have just initiated the probabilistic tsunami hazard maps you now for the uh, the makran region probably will be extending this uh, study to the entire coast 
Uh, I think uh, geomorphology has some uh, uh, impact on the tsunami, but I am not the the right person to answer it probably professor surya prakash uh, I, will, I will answer this <laughs> yeah. geology uh, you know that uh, it's a geology of the area which is uh, determining in terms of faults and plate margins movements it's not only the plate margin movements there can be intraplate earthquakes also which can generate uh, earthquakes it can be intraplate or intraplate earthquakes second uh, the, not only geology but morphology as he said morphology is indicated by topographical changes actually morphology if you have uh, the uh, low land areas coastal sites if the depth is shallow the water wave will rise more because the same energy that is indicated in terms of amplitude the uh, wave length will decrease and amplitude will increase so that's why impact may be higher in terms of shallower areas compared to deep areas Uh, yes sir one question is for actually uh, sir the question is raised by hari prasad ji what are the measures taken by government in strengthening community level preparedness yes for me yes sir okay see community uh, level preparedness is actually the key in our government policies plans and strategies what we are doing is all our disaster management authorities they are targeting the communities affected and trying to work in partnership with them because all the systems will be successful only if the recipient or the beneficiary for whom we are working are actually aware about it so we are trying to create awareness through education through training to sensitization through webinars through uh, dissemination of this knowledge uh, uh, web, through web media and online courses as well so uh, the community partnerships involvement of the ngos the community based organizations the volunteers now ndma has started aapka mitra scheme so they are also uh, getting involved into it and uh, we are also involving uh, in several other ways the self help groups in those areas so that's how the community will be integrated and actually we are this has to be starting from community level itself so bottom up approach will be more effective because tsunami is inevitable not a preventable disaster however the consequences can be and that would be only possible by the involvement of the communities the infrastructure and structural managements can be done by the government okay thank you sir uh, with this we have come to end of today session valediction uh, session now i would uh, like to call upon our ed and idm major general manoj kumar bindal vsm for his concluding remarks sir over to you thank you dr harjit uh, first of all i must thank all the speakers uh, uh, dr j radhakrishnan uh, for giving such a detailed uh, presentation of how nagapatnam tsunami was tackled and how it from a major tragedy how they turned it around and the resilience was built into the society with so many examples and with so many lessons learned and way forward which i think uh, our report will capture in the right sense and also uh, dr uh, patavi ramara who gave what enquires is doing and uh, the technological advancement that enquires has done which is generally not known to the people uh, except who are affected uh, i think this was a good forum to tell people about the uh, inquiries uh, leave, how it is growing by leaps and bounds and is giving impact based uh, warning and putting right up to which house is going to get affected which house is not going to get affected due to the resultant floods and other things so uh, it's uh, my uh, uh, thanks to inquiries for coming up with such uh, a uh, good uh, interventions and dr shivas uh, also for heading that organization and why uh, thank and coes uh, for collaborating with the nitm on such an important issue and we will continue this collaboration further uh, so that uh, the work of enquires is told to the people in the right sense and all the community that is the research community the academia the experts are also able to hear right from the enquires as to uh, what they are doing and how they can also contribute the work being done 
So we will uh, use this as a platform for that. I thank all the participants who have been patiently been listening uh, uh, this uh, webinar and the strength was quite a lot. It had uh, reached 900 at some point of time. Uh, so thank you so much. And thanks to Professor Surya Prakash, Dr. Harjit for moderating. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for our concluding remarks. Uh, now I would request Mr. Anil Kathath, young professional, GMR division, NIDM to present vote of thanks. W over to you, sir. Today we got the opportunity to enhance our understanding about that disaster, which is triggered by other hazards, such as submarine earthquake, landslides, and which is not frequent. So landslides have low frequency of occurrence, but they have also enormous destructive power causing damage to coastal communities worldwide. We witnessed the destructive power of the disaster during the Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004, which affected more than a dozen of nations. In India alone, thousands of people lost their lives besides huge monetary losses due to devastation of infrastructure and structure. To create a culture of safety and resilience against such nightmares, we need to focus on EAT. EAT here refers to education, awareness, and training. Education and awareness is required to enhance the understanding of risk of disasters. That is also a very first priority of Sendai framework. We need to make the RR a part of regular curriculum at schools as, as well as at in university level. Also, enhancing the capacity of communities is a crucial element. Eight point of our Honorable Prime Minister can point agenda on CRM also highlighted the need to build on local capacity and initiatives. People should also train when, what, and how they should respond to minimize the risk of disaster. An item has always been its so in this regard through its webinar training program, self-study programs, online thematic courses, publications. It has been our pleasure to host this webinar on tsunami risk reduction and resilience. And I thank INCOIS Ministry of Earth Science for collaborating with us to organize. I would like to propose hearty vote of thanks to dignitaries, Major General Manoj Kumar Bindal, BSM, Executive Director and IDM, Dr. T. Srinivasa Kumar, Director in INCOIS for their supervision and setting the contest of the webinar through their respective address. I also like to take this opportunity to thank our distinguished experts, Dr. J. Rasakrishnan, IS, Principal Secretary, Health and Family Welfare Department, Government of Tamil Nadu, Dr. E. P. Rama Rao, Scientist F. Inquiries, and Professor Surya Prakash, Head GMR Division and IDM, for making the webinar significant through their presentations, wisdom, experiences on various facets of tsunami, risk reduction, and resilience. I express a deep sense of gratitude to all the participants for their active participation. I would also like to thank my GMRT colleague, Dr. Harjit Kaur, for moderating and Mr. Raju Thapa for facilitating the webinar. With these words, I conclude my vote of thanks. Thank you. Over to you, Harjit. Thank you, sir. With that, we have come to the end of today's program. Now, I would request Mr. Raju Thapa to assist our participant and end the webinar. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ajit.